Hello, my brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Covenant of Grace Ministries channel. I'm Pastor Steve Williams, Jr., and we extend the love, the grace, and the peace of Jesus Christ uh, to each of you. Thank you for dedicating time to receive a word from the Lord. Um, we've been teaching on the Heart Murmur series, and our focus has been on God's heart murmurs for relationship. And on last time, we shared that God created mankind because he wanted to be in a relationship with him. Okay. Um, this lets us know that we are relational beings and our vertical relationship or our relationship with the Godhead, God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit should be the primary relationship in our lives. Not the only relationship, but the primary relationship in our lives, okay? And our relationship with God is not based on us changing our own heart to justify God's love to us. Our hearts change because we first receive the love of God. And so as we talked about this, we, we finished off by covering two areas that can hinder our relationship with God. First one that we talked about is religion. And we said that it's not that religion is bad, but that religion should not be, uh, it should be an output of our relationship with with the Godhead. And we've talked about there are many people who attend church, who give their offering and attend church events who are just checking the box and they have no personal relationship or no personal connection with the Lord. And that's not what he desires. He wants us to have a connection with him. We describe this as empty religion. Okay. Empty religion is this focus on checking a box, this focus on self-gratification and style instead of the, the presence and the connection of God. And then we talked about effective religion. Effective religion is just an output from our personal relationship with God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The other area we talked about was uh, centered on works. And we said that we don't want to be temporary laborers in God's corporation and not be connected to him. OK. And then we said specifically, we don't want to bring others to Christ. But when we actually meet Jesus, he tells us that he never knew us because we didn't have a personal relationship with him. And we lived a life that was full of iniquity. We practiced a lifestyle of sin with no remorse. And uh, so today we're going to cover the next uh, two points regarding God's perspective on relationships. So uh, before we begin, let's read our title scripture, which is found in Genesis chapter two, verse 18, but we're also gonna uh, read verses 21 through 25 as well for context purposes. All right. Scripture says, then the Lord said, it is not good for man for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. Point number two. God wants us to enjoy our marriage. And as we read this passage, we see that God is unselfish. You know, he could have said that I'm going to keep man all to myself. But no, he recognized that 
that man needed someone to support him on the earth, okay? He recognized the fish, the birds, the livestock, and the beast. They all had somebody, you know, but but Adam, Adam was rolling solo. Um, and, and the Lord basically said, hey, I can't do my boy like this. I'm going to hook him up. So he puts Adam in a deep sleep. He takes one of his ribs, and he from that, that rib, he forms woman. Adam names woman, you know, and then he brings the woman to Adam. Recognize there were there was no courting in the beginning. And but the, here's the beautiful thing about it, even though there, there wasn't any courting, she must have been to Adam's liking. So so that tells us that the Lord knew what Adam liked. OK, he 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 and he had. To, he, of course, he knows God knows because God is omniscient. He's all knowing and that's why God didn't, he didn't say to Adam, hey, try this out. And if you don't like it, no worries. I'll put, I'll put you back to sleep and we'll try it again. No, God got it right the first time because he knows everything. Okay. Now I'm going to say something that may sound controversial in today's world, but it's the truth because it aligns with God's word. Okay. Based on the creative order of God, of Yahweh. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Now, if you are a follower, not a fan, but a follower of Jesus Christ, this illustration provides the support for this. OK, this is how God established his creative order in the beginning. Now, here's the thing. We shouldn't waste our time arguing this point with people who are unsaved and, 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 and have been handed over to a reprobate mind. People in this category, they'll never get it. But here's the thing that we must do. We must use discernment when to speak the truth in love and when not to waste our time. You know, we have to recognize when we need to duck, dust the sand off of our feet and just keep it moving. OK, now let's take what we see in Genesis chapter two and let's bridge this principle uh, with the New Testament. So we're going to read Matthew chapter 19, verses four through six. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no person is to separate, okay? God's desire is for us to have a great marriage with our spouse. You know, his desire for us is for couples who are married to have a healthy relationship, you know? Some folks struggle and can't enjoy their marriage because here's the thing, God never brought you together with your spouse, okay? In, 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 in cases, in, in the description that I'm describing, we did this by being led by the flesh, okay? We didn't allow God to bring, to be a part of our relationship with our spouse. We just used our fleshly desires to do that, okay? Now, what the Lord wants to do this is his desire. He wants to have two people who are submitted to Jesus Christ to come together and be submitted to one another in a healthy relationship. OK, a marriage that. Understand. A marriage is not going to be perfect. OK, but what a marriage should do is it should have the capability in that relationship. There should be some maturity. And, 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 and some growth in that relationship over time. And that's what God is looking for, okay? Um, people who have submitted to Christ and come together, things aren't going to be perfect at first. Uh, but as they continue to seek God and, and, and seek the best for one another, there should be a, a growth in that relationship and a maturity in that relationship over time. Amen? Okay, now for those of us who are in a marriage where you may be born again, but your spouse is not not born again, 
Paul shares in 1 Corinthians 7 how we should function in this type of relationship. Don't feel like I don't I want to make sure when you get a chance, take a time, take some time and read it because it will really bless you and let you know that even in situations like that, God's blessing is over your marriage in, in these situations. So let's continue on. Um, I want to read Ephesians chapter five and we're going to read verses 20, 22 through 33. Scripture says, Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are parts of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, as for you individually, each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Okay, this passage of scripture shows us that a great marriage, uh, what a great marriage looks like in the, in the idealistic, idealistic picture of Christ and his bride, which represents the church, the body of Christ. All right. So when we see two people that love Christ, that love Jesus, and, and, and these same people love one another. That is the picture of what Christ and his church should look like. OK, now here's a question that we need to meditate on. Are we following these instructions? Are we following these instructions, couples, married couples? Are we following these instructions? Is this word in our hearts, you know? Husbands, I'm speaking to my husbands, are we loving our wives? Some of you may be saying, yeah, but she's not submitting to me. Okay, don't worry about that. But are here's the question, are we submitting to Christ? Okay, because when we do, when we submit to Christ, we establish, we create an environment that enables our wives to submit to us. Amen. And, and submission is not about dominating. It's about leading. And leading doesn't mean that we have to drive everything as husbands, okay? So let's move over to the wives. Wives, are we submitting to our husbands as our husbands submit to Jesus Christ, okay? Are we supporting our husband as he leads the family, are we setting our husbands up for success, which in turn sets up our family for success, for the blessings of God? OK, we read this passage many times, but if it's not being applied in our daily lives, then there's no power in this word. Amen. OK. And as I was reading this passage, Lord asked me, he said, you know, do you know why I didn't tell them to do the same thing? Do you know why I didn't tell the husbands and the wives to do the same thing? He said, husbands, love, wife, we need you, uh, respect. You know, why didn't he say for both to love and respect? So the Holy Spirit had me go back to Genesis chapter three in the garden. You remember what happened in Genesis three. Eve gets deceived by the serpent, right? Adam sees this 
but he does not protect or he does not cover his wife. But as a result, he takes a bite of the same fruit himself. So in this particular passage, we see two things. First thing, Eve didn't respect Adam enough to submit her thoughts to him. And here's the second point. Adam didn't love Eve enough to die for her. So instead, he dies with her. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say those two things again. Eve didn't respect Adam enough to submit her thoughts to him. That was number one. And Adam didn't love Eve enough to die for her. So instead, he dies with her. Now, we just spoke about the first Adam in Genesis 3. Now, let's look at the second Adam, Jesus. Now, what did Jesus do for his bride? OK, he does. Jesus didn't die with the church who was stained in sin. He chose to die for his bride. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Jesus didn't die with his bride who was stained in sin. He chose to die for his bride. And here's the thing. Aren't we glad he chose to die for us, church? Hallelujah. Glory to God. OK, what the first Adam didn't do is when he saw that his bride took a bite of that fruit, he should have said, baby, you shouldn't have done that. Do you realize the consequences of doing what you just did? This causes us to be connected from God the Father. Amen. He said, I love you. I love you, baby. And I'm not going to let you pay for this. So instead of God looking for Adam, Adam should have been looking for God. He should have confessed what he did to his father, because as the word says, God is faithful and just to forgive all of our sins. Amen. God is faithful and just to forgive all of our sins. He, he should have told his father, he should have said, Daddy, you gave me Eve and I love her. I know she disobeyed you and I understand the consequences for doing this, but I take responsibility as well because you gave me directive instructions. So instead of you punishing her, punish me so she can still have a personal relationship with you. Punish me for what she did because I love her that much. Church, this is what love is all about. It's sacrificial without any strings attached, church. Let's move on. Let's, let's read 1 John chapter 4. Verses 7 through 11, this illustrates what we just talked about. Beloved, beloved, let's love one another, for our love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this, the love of God was revealed in us, that God has sent his only son into the world so that we may live through him in this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if you, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God is love. Love is not what he does. Love is who God is is amen and a man and that should that should be our that should be in our characteristics as, as, as a couple as a covenant married couple a man's love for a wife just can't be words saying i love you baby his words must be demonstrated with loving actions amen true love agape love this godly love comes with expression and action. And Jesus saw us and he knew 
we needed to be reconciled with our heavenly father. He chose to be the sacrifice and bled out for us all for a mite, like we said last time, because he knew some of us might serve him, place our faith in, 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 place our faith in him as Lord and Savior. And he knew that, that there will be many who will not do that, but he chose to sacrifice his life for us anyway. But there's something, you know, um, that just amazes me, you know, as we think about this, you know, we say we understand what Jesus did for us, but here's the thing. Many times our response to his sacrifice doesn't line up. You know, what, what are we commanded to do as his bride? We're supposed to not only love God, but we're also supposed to submit and respect the sacrificial love that was given to us by Jesus, okay? So when we submit to Jesus Christ as Lord, we are saying to him, Lord, I honor and I respect what you did for me on the cross, and I submit to your kingdom authority. Now, as we compare this to our marriage relationship, husbands, we should be bleeding out to our wives in love. And wives, there should be respect and honor to our husband, to your husbands, for his authority is given to him by God. OK, here's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Husbands, are we being sacrificial in our love? Or are we being selfish in our love? OK, here's a question to the wives. Am I respecting and, and am I respecting and honoring, you know, what is being given to me or am I rejecting it? Amen. Let, I, I will say this. This is this type of love. It's a process, church. It's a process. No marriage starts off perfect. But here's the thing. If both parties are committed to God, if both parties are committed to their relationship and are patient and loving with one another, both will witness the relationship blossom over time, okay? God wants us to enjoy our relationship with him, but he also wants us to enjoy our marriage because he instituted this relationship, amen? Having a healthy marriage is one of the most effective ways to draw people to Jesus Christ. You see, a healthy covenant marriage positions us to receive God's blessing, which not only benefits us, but it also benefits those that are in our circle. And that is why the enemy is always trying to wreak havoc on God's first institution of marriage. He's always trying to wreak havoc on God's institution of marriage, okay? Because he understands that a healthy marriage counters his agenda to steal, to kill, and destroy. All right? Praise God. Hopefully we we hit that one good on, on marriage. Let's move over to our, our, our final point, point number three. God wants us to enjoy our friendships. And I know my single people are like, what about us? What about us? I want my single people to understand that being single is not a curse on your existence, okay? Being single is a blessing just like being married is a blessing, okay? And I know that there are some single folks out here who want to get married, okay? That doesn't mean you have to stay in one spot, and, you know, to get married. Get on out there. Get out and do some things, you know? Enjoy yourself. Enjoy your life. And have fun in the Lord, okay? To my single ladies, don't make your social media status, I'm not married yet, okay? Ladies, enjoy being single until you are found. I'm going to say that again. Enjoy being single until you are found. I want to read Proverbs 18, verse 22. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure, and he receives favor from the Lord. You see, the scripture says, 
a man finds a wife. It doesn't say a woman finds a husband, okay? It doesn't say a man finds a woman either. The scripture says the man finds a wife, okay? I hope we get that. The man doesn't find a woman. The man finds a wife. A man is how he made you, but a wife is how he finds you, ladies. I'm going to say that again. A man is how he made you, but a wife is how he finds you. So women, don't look for a husband. You are supposed to be found. Men, you're supposed to look and not be found, okay? So men, if you are being pursued by a woman, that that is contrary to kingdom order. It, it's almost like me trying to flash my lights to pull over a police car. I can't do that because I don't have the authority to pull the cop over. But the cop has the authority to pull me over, right? Here's the thing about my single, go back to my single folks. Single folks enjoy being single in the Lord, okay? Make some friends. Have a relationship with friends who are like-minded. And don't ever feel like you are not a blessing from the Lord, okay? Now, for those of you who are married, we understand that our spouse is our friend, but our spouse can't be everything to us, right? It's okay to have healthy friendships outside of our marriage, all right? God created us to have these friendships. Why? Why did he do so? Because he is our friend and we are his friend, okay? Let's read Proverbs 11, verse 30, it says, the seeds of, of good deeds become a tree of life. A wise person wins friends. Now, there are a lot of mean church folk who say they love God, but don't have any friends. You know, these people claim because of their relationship with God that they can't be friends with people. Now, I'm not saying you, you got to have a, a boatload of friends. But but folks, we ought to have at least a handful of friends that we that that we that we roll with. Right. Think about this. We came into a relationship with a loving God who made us his friend. And because of our love for him, we can't get along with other people he made. Does that make any sense? You know. Some some folks may say, well, you know, I have such a, a disciplined life in the Lord but that it it just rubs people the wrong way. It's not them. It's you. OK, you are just mean. You are just in a mean place all of the time instead of blame and instead of blaming yourself, you are blaming God for not being able to get along with others now. That was never God's intent for us to be ugly towards our brothers and our sisters, you know, the people he made along with us. OK, you know, and some folks may say, well, my prayer life rubs people the wrong way. Well, I contend you must be praying wrong. Because that's not God's will for us. OK, let's read Proverbs 27 and 17. Scripture says that iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. A real friend sharpens our character. A real friend sharpens our integrity. A real friend sharpens our fidelity for Christ. Okay, this scripture is should be a gauge for our true friendships. Okay, a person who is not a friend will always cause us to become carnal, to complain and, and, and they, you know, and, and, and pull us away from the Lord, basically. OK, and, and here's something that I've learned for over the years. And this is for, for us to all just just to, I, I want folks to listen. Here's a decision that I've made as I've gotten older, it, uh, older in my years. I'm not going to be in any friendship that will allow me to wallow in my own mess. I'm not going to be into 
get into any relationship or friendship that causes me to be depressed, to have low self-esteem, or, or, or to be disobedient to the Lord, okay? We must have people in our circle who have the courage to check us when we need it, right? Hey, what you doing? You know, what's going on with you? You know, we need to have people that will give us counsel about life, about work, about marriage, about kids, you name it, okay? Here's the thing about having that good friend that, that can check us, that, that, that can hold us accountable. You know, a good friend can provide us a different perspective on things that, that opens our eyes to see things differently. Amen. And that's good. Praise God. All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's summarize this teaching on God's heart murmurs for relationship. We, we, we're going to cover those three points. First point, God wants us to enjoy his relationship with us because he created us. This is our foundational relationship, right? Point number two, God wants us to enjoy our relationship with our spouse because he created marriage. Point number three, God wants us to enjoy our relationships with our friends because he is our friend. Amen. All right. Now, when we have these three areas of relationships hitting on all six cylinders, Oh boy, you talk about fruitful. We are fruitful beings when this occurs. We're full of love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, kindness, goodness, faith. You know, those, those, that fruit will just be this overflowing. And you know what fruit does? It attracts others to us. Amen. Here's the thing about these relationships, these areas of relationships, they all go hand in hand, but it starts with the foundational relationship with our Heavenly Father, right? If our relationship with our Heavenly Father is lacking and we say that the other, our other relationships, our relationship with our spouse and our relationships with our friends are good, then really we are lying to ourselves, okay? Truthfully, we're lying to ourselves. We can't have a good relationship with our spouse or our friends without a good relationship with our Heavenly Father, okay? A lawyer asked Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, he said, teacher, one of the Pharisees, I believe, he said, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus responded in verse 37 and said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So these two commandments are tied to relationships, which let which which confirms and lets us know that relationships are important in the heart of God. Amen. If someone today recognizes that you may have a distance between yourself and God, if there's someone today who recognizes that there may be some distance in your relationship with your spouse or your relationships with your friends. I encourage you to come back to the father today and receive and experience his love for you because God's heart murmurs for relationship. God's heart murmurs for relationship. Now, if you're watching, you recognize that you either haven't accepted Jesus Christ into your life or maybe you have and you stepped away or, or maybe because of this teaching today, you just want to commit 
or recommit, you know, your life, your, you know, relationship with the Lord and your, you know, recommitting your relationship with your spouse or your friends. Just, just please say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says, Whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray and ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and be Lord over my life. I believe that you shed your blood, died on the cross for me, and rose again from the dead. I repent and turn from my sins. I need you, Jesus. I no longer want to be in control of my life. Please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and be my personal Lord and Savior from this day forward. Please give me the strength by your precious Holy Spirit to live for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. A few things I want to share before we close with our benediction. You know, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if this message has blessed you, um, be a blessing for someone else by sharing today's message with, with others. Allow the Holy Spirit to uh, lead you in deciding who to share this message with. Um, Pastor Spryland and I appreciate all of your support through your, your prayers of encouragement, your, your words of encouragement, and, 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 and your gifts that you give. Um, if you would like to plant a financial seed, the information is, is shown right there on the screen for you to do so. Uh, don't want you to forget Thursday, Pastor Spradley will be sharing his prophetic soundbite that comes directly from uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So I just encourage you to get ready, get ready, get ready for another rich dose of God's words to encourage you and uplift your souls. OK, all right. We're going to close with our benediction. And now to him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. May the love of God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we have the blessed opportunity to come together again in Christian fellowship. And all of God's people responded with a prayer of agreement by saying, Amen. Love you all. God bless you, and we will see you next week.